It was in doing that that I realized, oh my gosh, I love little people. It's the little people that I want to teach. I think many teachers even make the mistake of diving right back into the content and curriculum too quickly after winter break. But it resonated with me this morning. You can't regulate your students if you're not regulated yourself. What are the must do things for parents when it comes to their children in school from a teacher's point of view? In fact, from November of 2019 to April 2021, SEL spending grew by 45% uh, to almost 765 million. I mean, it's a hard balance. It really is. I mean, you're exhausted. It's like you do it all day and then you come home and do it all night. Would you rather walk barefoot in a public restroom or monitor standardized <laughs> testing for different classrooms eight hours straight? The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features in-depth interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, help, and learning. Whether you're seeking inspiration, motivation, or simply looking to learn something new, the Avenue of the Strongest has something for everyone. Today, we have the privilege of hosting a remarkable individual who will share her extensive knowledge and experiences in the field of primary education. Our guest, Ms. Lindsay Sauer, also known as Sweet and Sour Firsties on Instagram, is a seasoned educator and mother who offers a unique perspective on the challenges and triumphs of being a teacher. Ms. Sauer has been a teacher for over eight years and has a passion for creating a nurturing and inclusive learning environment for her students. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go ahead and get started by learning more about you, Lindsay. Did you always know you wanted to be a teacher at a young age? And when did you know and decide that you wanted to pursue teaching at an elementary school level? Sure. So I have kind of an interesting story. First of all, growing up, I was not a fan of school. I felt like I wasn't seen. Teachers didn't try to reach me in a way that, you know, I understood. And so... I had kind of like a rocky path where for a long time, I wasn't sure if I even enjoyed school or liked it. Like I liked learning and things, and but I never really felt like I got it or that I was even as smart as the other children. And so, you know, you can imagine how that feels as a young child. And then it wasn't until, you know, later in high school where I was like, hey, I actually really enjoy learning and it can be really fun. And hey, it has some teachers who like actually care. And so like, just even that, like the smallest of things and the way that the teachers talk to you, interact with you, like really completely shifted my mindset. And then I was like, maybe I do want to become a teacher. And so it was this weird journey where I was like, maybe I want to teach high school English. Maybe I want to teach college. And then at one point, I'm not kidding you. I enjoyed you know, teaching and Spanish so much. And I am not a native speaker. Like, let's just be clear that I started taking more Spanish classes in college and was like, hey, you know what? Wow. I'm going to go teach elementary kids Spanish. And I was like, what am I thinking? Like, I was never very comfortable speaking Spanish, but it was trying to find that connection and like where I fit in because I really enjoyed it. But I was like, oh, I don't know if that's the right thing for me. And so it wasn't until I actually decided to join the education program and then I went through, you know, you have these field studies that you do. You go to different types of schools. I went to a Montessori school. I went to a middle school. I went to different elementary schools. And it was in doing that that I realized, oh, my gosh, I love little people. It's the little people that I want to teach. And I realized it was that. It was going in a first grade classroom. I'll never forget. They went outside to do a lesson on push and pull. And I just watched mm -hmm their engagement. I watched them learning and those light bulbs click. And it was that moment right there where I was like, this, this is what I want to do. Wow. No, that's incredible. And I love the, I love the journey of you starting out uh, with not enjoying school as much, <clears throat> but then as you progressed on, you actually really enjoyed uh, learning. And now you're, now you've been a teacher for, for many, many years. I have a, it's, it's a similar story, but it's, it's interesting. I always loved school at a young age. Uh, and then as I got to high school, I just started to not like school. Yeah. Um, the teachers were great, but I just, I don't know. I, I, and I, when I, when I went to college also, I was like, oh my mm -hmm. God, this is, what am I doing here? This is so boring, but it's so funny because we literally, every company that we have right now is in the education sector. We own a preschool where we, we have a publishing company. We serve uh, students from K to eight. Uh, so it's very interesting that I, 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 I didn't like me exp my experience in undergrad as much. I mm -hmm. thought it was boring, uh, yeah. but somehow I found myself completely <laughs> immersed in the education sector. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> It's, 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 I always like, like learning about stories because, you know, so many people have yeah. different stories and they end mm -hmm. up 
in, in, in one sector. So it's really interesting to learn about. Uh, yeah. So I know you have two beautiful children. Uh, mm -hmm. In your current About Me section on your website, you state that I am a working mom who changed everything this year by re-entering the classroom and completely revamping everything about my practice. Okay, I love that. Uh, this is like, this is something that I always like to ask teachers uh, when they were teaching without kids before, like their own kids, yeah. and then they yeah. have kids and all of a sudden you see they're doing something different. Uh, so yeah. how has being a parent changed you as a teacher? So, you know, I think the biggest shift I had was with my son because that's when I became a mom. And, you know, I always enjoyed hands-on learning. I always enjoyed, you know, creating relationships with students, but it wasn't until I had my son and I actually was very fortunate to have the first year of his life. I got to be home with him and I wasn't in the classroom. And so literally spending my entire day with him, just watching him mm -hmm. learn and watching him grow, I realized that I was like, especially having a boy too. I mean, I, I going up as a girl is different. Having a boy is completely different. It's taught me a lot. <laughs> and why is why why is that different? <laughs> so because he just, I'm not kidding. From the moment he could move, he was ready to go. He was nonstop. He's still like that. He never stops moving. He never stops interacting. And just watching how he learn to develop it's very it's much through like doing things you know mm -hmm. and breaking things and seeing what happens when you interact with things and so watching him even as a baby be like that it made me realize okay wait i need to stop and pause for every boy i have in my class what am i not doing for them and that's when i implemented flexible seating that's when i implemented play-based learning and those types of hands-on things where you know I just, I go back and think about before having him and seeing, especially my boys, and I'm not saying it wasn't my girls too, but my boys rocking back and forth in chairs, sitting on their knees, and I would just be so frustrated. And then it was like, it wasn't until I had my son that I was like, oh wait, that's me. I need to do something different. I need to make sure that they have space to move and can do and be free and do what they need. And so it was like, that right there was the biggest impact. And he still is affecting me as an educator every single day with him, especially he has ADHD. And, you know, that in itself is like, I've been a huge learning curve for me and learning right. how to support him and meet his needs. We're in occupational therapy. It's all these things that I didn't know much about, but again, I'm still learning, but you know, it affects me as an educator to, okay, how can I be more supportive for these students? What can I do to make it better for them and for the other children? Because if they can benefit from it, then every other child in my classroom can as well. And so it's really those things that really made me take a step back and realize, okay, it's not about me at all. It's actually all about them and what I can do to help them create the best environment for them to learn in. Wow. No, that's, that's, that's incredible. And that's actually a real, that's a really good story because, uh, as you know, there's a lot of students that are obviously enrolled in special education and mm -hmm. general education teachers also have special education students in their classrooms. Right. And so now you, you know, you're able to get a greater look because I, I we've talked with, uh, we've spoken with many special education teachers as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they talk about the disconnect between yeah. the special education teachers and general education teachers, slight totally. disconnect. Uh, yeah. but now, you know, you're, you know, you, you're really able to serve all types of students uh, mm -hmm. from your own personal experiences. Right. Uh, so no, that's, that's, uh, that's incredible. So I, I obviously let's go ahead and follow up with the theme of being a parent and teacher. So being a parent, but also a teacher sounds incredibly challenging. <laughs> They're probably the two most demanding, challenging and rewarding jobs all at the same time. Yep. Uh, with that being said, what advice can you share with teachers who are about to have their own child and will have to deal with managing being both a parent and a teacher? Yeah, I mean, it's tough for sure. I know, especially, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, it actually was, you know, the year of COVID when everything shut down. But I remember having, my son was three at the time, I believe, and I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, a young boy in my class in second grade, because that year I taught first and second. And I remember being so frustrated because some of the behaviors that my son displayed, I also was dealing with, with one of my second grade boys. And I just remember feeling so overwhelmed and frustrated because it was like, I never got a break from that. And I, I would, and I got triggered too. I would like be getting triggered by my student at school and my son, because they were both having these behaviors and it took a great deal of patience. But I mean, I think the biggest learning out of that is, okay, what can I do to support these two children? And are there things that I, that I'm doing at home that can transfer over to school and vice versa. And so I think the biggest thing is when you become a parent and a teacher, you 
it's hard to do this, but you kind of have to like try to separate those two things, mm. especially if I think the hardest thing is when you have kids that you're teaching the same age as your kids are at home, because mm. again, you can be dealing with some of those same behaviors, but at the same time, you also can stop and think, okay, what is working here that I can take here and vice versa so that you're, you're not, you know, reinventing the wheel. You're not trying different things. You're seeing, okay, will this work at home? Cause it's working at school. And you know what? It turned out it did. It was like things that I would do with my son would then work with my second grader. And of course my son was three, so it wasn't exactly the same, but I could still learn from him and apply it to my son too. And so, I mean, it's a hard balance. It really is. I mean, you're exhausted. It's like you do it all day and then you come home and do it all night. But like you said, like not only is it one of the most exhausting things, but it also is one of the most rewarding things. And so, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's just, it's tough. It really is tough but you can gain things from both home and school that you can transfer to each other, you know? Mm. No, I, I, I love the fact that you pointed out uh, if you're teaching the same grade and uh, you have a child at home that's the same age. I, I can, I, I just, I have never thought about this, but you're right. It would certainly be triggering. I think you mm -hmm. as a parent can get triggered much quicker because yeah. you know you're dealing with something 24 7 right you yeah. have your kids then right. you go to your classroom they're all the same age so a lot of the behaviors right. or things that they're doing can be similar uh but aside from that there's also a beauty to that because as you yeah. mentioned you obviously you do a lot of trial and error with your own mm -hmm. child yeah. you find out what works and you can take those best practices and apply it to your classroom and see if it works totally. Well, and I mean, I actually wrote a quote today that I've heard many times, but it resonated with me this morning. You can't regulate your students if you're not regulated yourself. And so mm. I think that's one of been, especially having my son, you know, uh, it's taught me a lot more about being a parent. And then, of course, that just transfers over to being a teacher as well, learning mm. how to regulate myself, learning how to help him regulate and seeing exactly like I'm sure we're going to hit on, like I'm sure many teachers do, how important social emotional is. And mm -hmm. I actually had a conference for my son. Uh, you know, he's in kindergarten right now and the beginning of the year was really tough for him. And it was, it's us doing all these things to try to help him again, be regulated so that he can learn because we know if you are not ready to learn, then you just can't learn. And so just that's the other thing is like seeing how important social emotional is and meeting mm -hmm. their needs. And, you know, I felt guilty as a mom when at home I haven't done as much academics as I wanted to. Being a teacher is like, you know, it makes you feel a level of guilt, but then also knowing like, but wait, I'm helping regulate him. I'm doing other things at home to help his body be ready to learn. And so I can't feel guilty about not focusing on the ac academics right now when we focused so much on the social emotional. And I mean, that's huge. No, definitely. And and so talking about getting ready to learn, I want to go ahead and slightly transition over and talk about a topic on getting ready to learn. So I was reviewing your posts and blogs, and I saw some really good advice when it comes to navigating your students in classroom after a vacation, specifically in this oh, yeah. case, we're talking about a winter break. Uh, yeah. How long is winter break in Colorado? So it's weird. It seems like it gets shorter, shorter every year, which I, that like can't be the case, but I swear, like, I was like, wait, I feel like we used to have like two and a half weeks. Now it's like a week and a half. I don't know. Sometimes it's like a week, but I think, I think in general, it's been like, I would say between a week and a half and two weeks, depending on like the dates and where they fall. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I was, I was trying to search up how long winter break is in Colorado. And I was yeah. like shocked. It looked like way longer than New York city. Like New York City's winter break is roughly 10 days. And then I, I maybe it was a wrong calendar, but on your mm -hmm. calendar, it looked like two and a half weeks. Right. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it used to be. I don't know about it anymore, but I feel like it used to be longer. <laughs> yeah. Pro I was probably t looking at a pre-COVID calendar. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, so so uh, I'll, I'll get back on topic. So winter break obviously is an extended period of time where students yeah. and teachers can take a break and relax. Yeah. And uh, as you can imagine, students are not looking forward to coming back to the classroom. Uh, let's be real. Even teachers. Teachers yeah. are not looking forward nope. to coming back to the classroom. <laughs> I mean, who does, right? right. Um, but the point, I mean, the point here is uh, some teachers, or I, I think many teachers even, make the mistake of diving right back into the content and curriculum too yeah. quickly after winter break, which you heavily advise against it. That makes so much sense. And I was like, oh, wow, this is this sounds so obvious. But this, right. this was like the first post that I've seen like on your social media talking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's such good advice. Can you share some of your routines and activities? And what do you do on the first week students are back after a vacation, like winter break, to help them transition back into learning new content? 
Sure. Yeah. The one benefit is, is like they bounce back pretty quickly because they've already been in school for so long. But just like you said, not only do they need some time to get back into routines, but teachers do as well. Everyone's tired. You know, you probably haven't slept with an alarm. You haven't had to go back to a rigid schedule. And so usually during that, the first few days, especially, I like to ease back in. And one thing I noticed, and it was that group of kids that I had the year of COVID, they loved to talk all the time, all of them. And I was like, at first I was frustrated, right? I'm like, okay, well, we have learning to do. Why, why you guys want you to stop talking? But then it made me realize, oh wait, like I need to let them talk. I need to, mm-hmm. you know, add in activities where they have time to talk. I need to just like take it slow and let them talk because that was, that group really made me realize, okay, they missed each other too. Ding, ding, ding. Of course they did. Like, yes, maybe they love school and love learning, but they also love their friends. Right. And so right. one thing that I love to do, especially is during that first morning back together, ease back into it. We don't like dive into anything quickly. And I just let them talk. I let them, you know, we do an activity called uh, stand up, hand up, pair up where they stand up, they put their hand up and they go find a partner and then they get to talk with their partner. Talk about, you know, what you did that you enjoyed. Talk about why you're excited to be back at school. And one thing that I noticed, so I've worked a lot in title one schools. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of those children may not have had a good time on winter break. They may have been really looking forward to be back at school and being with their Mm -hmm. friends. And so I try to avoid activities where they talk about their winter break and Mm -hmm. share about their favorite thing because one, maybe they didn't have a good winter break. Two, they might not even celebrate the same holidays as everyone. So I just try to stay away from that and let them instead talk about, you know, what they missed, why they're excited to be back, what they're looking forward to. And then it also gets them back in the mindset of being back at school together. And so just easing back in those first few days. And one thing that I also really like to do is since, again, they've already spent a lot of time learning about the routines and procedures, it's just a, like a quick review. And so, you know, mm-hmm. primary being they might need a little bit more time, <laughs> a little bit more exposure, a little bit more practice. And so we do like a mystery sticky note where um, there's like this giant sheet of paper and behind it, there's a reward. And then on top of it are all these sticky notes with different routines. Like we all lined up quietly. We all cleaned up at the end of the day. And so they get to work together as a class, which is a bonus. And then they get to reveal the reward behind it, which is like super engaging and they love it. And again, it's like, we're easing back into it and we're like finding fun ways to practice instead of, you know, diving right back, right back into content. Cause then it like, again, it leads to frustration from us because they're not ready. Maybe we're not ready and we don't want to be there either. And we want to be home sleeping <laughs> or they, they just need more time to like, let's just like chill a little bit. Like we're going to get to it. And one of my favorite quotes that I use, especially at the beginning of the year is go slow to go fast. And so Mm -hmm. just take it slow because then when you give them the time to ease back in, talk to their friends, get regulated, get their bodies ready to learn again, then we can rush back into content when they're ready. And usually I spend about the first week. And again, like I, you know, first grade, they're little, (laughs) so we need a little bit more time. And if they're ready, then like we go into it, but if they're not, okay, let's, let's give ourselves a little buffer room and we'll practice you know, all those routines again, we'll spend time connecting again and doing community building activities. And those are some of my favorites to do when we come back together. And that's for after, you know, I know, like you said, you mentioned New York, like they may have a, a shorter winter break, but they they also have like, you know, I, I just spoke with some New York teachers today that they have another break. I don't know what this one's called, but it's like a winter break in February mm-hmm. for the whole yeah. week. I'm like, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. And then there's like spring yeah. breaks. So it's like giving yourself time to like ease back in after those, you know, especially like a week or more off, just like, just take it slow. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to steal your uh, statement, which is go slow to go fast. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I actually love that. Yeah. So, and, and uh, you're a hundred percent correct, by the way. Uh, it's very, very true. Uh, so I want to go ahead and now talk about uh, something that you're working on, you're launching some self-paced course for other teachers called Building a Student-Centered Classroom. The goal of this course is to help other teachers create a successful classroom from A to Z. Uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about this course and who it's, I mean, obviously it's intended for teachers, but I want to go ahead and learn more about this course that you're building. Sure. So it's actually finished now. Okay. And congratulations, by yes, the way. Yes, thank you. Uh, the last time I checked it out, I know that there was a, it's, it's a wait list. Is it, is it still a wait list or is it actually uh, a Yes. List? So I typically launch it um, two or three times a year. Um, okay. So it's, it's, it's for like, it's intention is for back to school, but you can always, if you're, you know, your students are really struggling in the middle of the year, you can say, 
okay, wait, we need to like stop. I need some more help. I need to figure out what I can do to get these kids more successful. Cause again, the goal is always to get kids ready to learn. And so the, the goal behind building a student center classroom is to show teachers like how to spend, especially those first weeks of school, setting up their classroom so that they can be successful and independent so that their classroom almost runs itself. And it really is mm -hmm. a student center classroom. And that's all those things that I've talked about. It's taking it slow, spending a lot of time and being really explicit when you teach routines and procedures, spending a lot of time building community, building relationships, getting to know your students, because ultimately that's what I've always fallen back on as a teacher is when we're really mm -hmm. struggling. Because if you have that strong foundation and that community, then you can say, okay, well, like, let's take a step back and figure out what we can do better as a team. And knowing that it's not my classroom, it's our classroom. And that all comes part of that. So that again, once you spend those first, you know, and I always say six weeks and I get a lot of gawks at that. How do you spend six weeks? And it's like, okay, well, we do like, there are bits and tidbits of content, but like the biggest thing is, teaching those procedures, teaching those routines, building that community, you know, instilling those rules that, you know, we are all going to do this together so that when that six, that six week mark comes up, we are ready to hit the ground running. And it's so much easier. We're not, you know, distracted by behaviors. We're not stopping our instruction. It's like, they just, they get it and they do it. And it's, I mean, it really is a beautiful thing and they can run the classroom like you're not even there. And I mean, like, it sounds magical, but like, you can do it. You know, I've done this for many years and it really, it just, it like helps with that teacher burnout, right? Because you're not, you're not just putting out little fires all day long. You are teaching, which is what we want to do and what we love to do. And I think that's why so many teachers are frustrated right now. It's because they feel like, you know, we're not doing what we love. We can't spend yeah, time teaching or regulating students or having to teach a curriculum that we don't think is best practice. It's hard. No, 100%. Uh, curiosity, I, I imagine building a self-paced course like that takes a lot of time and energy. So how long are we talking, right? That's a, it's a lot, right? People don't really realize just in yeah. general how much work goes in behind, you know, just setting up your landing page and then the wait list and all these things. And yeah. I, you're, you're collecting email addresses and I'm sure you have them on a campaign sequence to keep mm -hmm. them engaged and when they do enroll. And if they do enroll, you have to send up follow-up emails and reminders and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So mm -hmm. it's a lot that goes on it behind the scenes. Yeah. And uh, I, so it actually started, I had a student teacher of the year. I was pregnant with my son and I just started like, writing all these questions on a notebook for her, for her to like think through and plan out when she was getting ready to set up her first classroom. And I was like, Hey, I bet other teachers could use this. And so then I started creating a book and I spent, I don't know, a year creating the book. Then I had to like make it pretty. So people would actually want to buy it. <laughs> Not just like a list of yeah. different random questions. And then, then it got updated again and it got updated again. And then I'm like, Hey, I could make a course out of this that people would really enjoy and get a lot of use out of. And so it was like, breaking that book down into smaller bite-sized chunks and figuring out a sequence that worked that made sense for teachers. And then I had to redo that again. And so it's like, this is, I mean, this has been five years now and it's still, wow. even this year, I'm planning this summer to add another module for teachers for the middle of the year because it's like, you get good and then all of a sudden it's like everybody forgot everything in like October and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? And so I'm like, okay, yeah. wait, I need to help. Like, I, I, like, let's talk about what we can do when things go off the rail. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. And uh, so I want to go ahead now and transition into another topic. I want to talk about all the busy parents out there because there's a lot of parents who are super busy. Um, and so... What are some things that you would highly recommend parents uh, make sure to do for their children when it comes to school? Whether it's, hey, parents, no matter how busy you are, mm -hmm. number one thing, or one of the top two things I'd recommend is make sure your child completes their homework on a daily basis. Or yeah. number two is, hey, check in with your child to see how their mental health is doing. Right. We're also caught up in doing a million things at the same time. But yeah. of course, parents are always worried about their children. So the question is, what are the must-do things for parents when it comes to their children in school from a teacher's point of view? Sure. So, you know, something that I always told parents, and I still do, the most important thing that you do with your child is read with your child. If you don't do anything else, like, because I had parents even in first grade saying, well, why don't we have homework? And I'm like, because all I want you to do is read. That's it. 
That's all you need to do. If you read with your child, everything else will come. And that's what I've had to fall back on as a parent now when we're super busy and overwhelmed and we have occupational therapy and we have play therapy and we have blah, 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 blah. You name it. There's Taekwondo. I mean, I am living the busy parent life now. And what do we make sure we do every night? We read. That's it. Talk to your child, read with your child, ask them how their day was. And that can be hard, especially I know having, I see my son and my daughter, how was your day? My daughter's too. She goes, rattles off this whole long list of everything she did and who she played with and who she talked to. And my son, good. It was good. And so instead of just asking like, how was your day? Who did you play with today? What's something new you learned today? And finding other ways to engage them that you're still getting to connect with them and you're not overwhelming them too. And just again, like giving them that space. So I see like, especially when he comes home, he might need to like a little time to decompress and, you know, either play quietly. And so I might give him a little time and then we come together and we talk, you know, and connect with like, who, who are your friends or, you know, what did you do today? And so it's just those things I find to be the most valuable as a parent and as a teacher, because then you're, again, you're connecting with their mental health. You're trying to establish where they're at and how you can support them. And then reading, you know, another one of my favorite quotes is, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the whole thing, but it's like, readers are built on the laps of their parents, hmm. something to that effect, because it's like, okay. if you build in that love of reading, if, if you're worried that your child is struggling with, you know, their letter sounds, or maybe they don't have their numbers. I mean, you can always play games. That's the other thing too, is like playing a board game, build in lots of skills and you can practice other things in there. But again, the most important thing I always say is just reading with them. And it's mm -hmm. another great way to connect with them no matter what. So most questions, of course, uh, typically have open-ended responses. I'm convinced that the question I just asked you is th that is probably the correct answer because I was, I, I, I've asked this question to a couple of other individuals as well, and they all gave the same exact, in fact, I was speaking with, um, Jen Jones from North Carolina. She is a, she runs hello literacy. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, she's yeah, a K-12 yeah. literacy expert. Yeah. That was literally the same exact advice she gave, which was, yeah. I don't care what you do. You don't yeah. have to do anything. Nope. Talk with your children, read to your children. I don't care if it's an encyclopedia, if yeah. they're two months old, <laughs> just read, yeah. read to them, yeah. read, read, read. And that yeah. is such valuable advice. It's so simple, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're, we're always looking for the most complicated solutions. You know, right. Hey, tell me, what do I need to buy? You know, yeah. what cool technology? No, you don't right. need to buy anything. No. You just, yeah. it's just your time just That's and it. you just read and exactly. communicate. But that, I, and I it's love fun that. Too, when we're busy, right? I mean, there are nights where you're just exhausted and you don't want to do it. And you've been doing things all day, but as long as you like, just spend five minutes reading a book, that's it. Mm -hmm. And it really makes a huge difference. I mean, I see it in my children, you know, just talking with them and reading with them because again, like I told you, like, I feel that guilt now being a teacher and a mom that I am not, I'm not over here practicing flashcards and I'm not over right. here doing a bunch of math problems because we have so many other social emotional needs that we need to meet right. first that I just haven't had the time to do it. And so we make sure we talk, we make sure we read and play and that's it. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's incredible. So now I want to talk slightly, actually, let's go ahead and uh, dive right into social emotional learning because that keeps coming up. Uh, so the SEL sector, the, so for people who don't know what SEL is, it's the social and emotional learning. Uh, that's obvious. It's always been around, but uh, lately, uh, for the past couple of years, SEL has become a top priority in uh, uh, integration in classrooms and curriculums and textbooks. Uh, actually, in fact, from November of 2019 to April 2021, SEL spending grew by 45% uh, to wow. almost $765 million. So uh, I want to ask you for some basic, uh, actually, it's a very basic question, but also very important. What is mm -hmm. SEL and why is it important? Yeah. Well, yeah, like you said, I've already touched on it a lot because it is that important. It's we can't meet their academic needs until we meet their emotional needs because they're just not ready to learn. And so, you know, as you explain, SEL is social emotional learning. And, you know, there are people talk about it in different ways. People, you know, some people aren't sure what it is. And it, it's just very simple. It's teaching your students how to be kind, teaching your students how to make good choices teaching your students how to regulate and calm their bodies when they have all these feelings and even teaching them what feelings are. And so it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be a huge piece of your learning, but it is important in the classroom when we need to learn how to work together as a group. Okay, well, we can't do that if we are all dysregulated and angry. Okay, we need to mm -hmm. learn how to calm our bodies now. 
we also can't work together as a group if we don't know how to be kind to one another and be a good friend to one another. And it's just very simple things. You know, like one of my favorite ways to teach it is, I mean, there's so many amazing books out there. I mean, and I'm sure many teachers know, I mean, there's just, uh, you name it. There's a skill that you want to work on. There's a book to do it. And how better to teach students about a skill than through a book. And I'm actually doing that this week. We're going to read those shoes because I'm going with a group who need a little bit more support with kindness. And so we're going to do an empathy activity, learn about what empathy means and learn how, again, why is kindness important? Why do we need to display it? And how does it affect our learning? If we can't be kind, then we aren't ready to learn. And we can't right. hit on those academic skills if we're just not ready. And I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. And it's been so exacerbated with COVID because I mean, look at we as humans need connections. We weren't able to get those connections and we were isolated. And it's just those types of things aren't good for humans. And so it's been exacerbated all these issues that we may not have seen or have been more hidden that now are like, oh, hello, like this child really needs more support. And we can't, we can't even learn. Like I see that so much from teachers. They're like, I've never had a group like this. This group is struggling so much. Mm -hmm. Even my son's kindergarten teacher, she's like, listen, we are just, <laughs> we are focusing a lot on social emotional skills. I'm like, good. That's like, that's what they need, especially at that right. age. Like, let's get them right. good. So that by the time they're in fifth grade and beyond, they have the regulation skills they need. They know how to calm their sons down. They know how to be a good friends so that they can just spend the time learning. And that's why it's so important. Oh, that's a, that's that's a really that's some really good insight. And talk, I, I know you mentioned that there are an abundant amount of resources out there for just about yeah. any skill that you want to target. I want to focus on the word mm -hmm. abundance. Uh, so I want to slightly transition into having an abundance of ed tech startup companies. Uh, obviously, um, during the pandemic and still now, there are teachers are teachers and districts and administrators are hit with all these new ed tech companies that have huge fundings that have released, mm -hmm. whether it's an app, whether it's a website, right. whether it's a tool, uh, sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming, right? Teachers are like, oh my God, yeah. I just, I, I, 50 different solutions, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I, like to, I like to ask this question to sometimes to teachers, uh, do you have uh, you know one or two favorite apps or websites that you like using as a classroom teacher? Oh, sure. So yeah, there are so many and there's more cropping up every day that are so cool. But I will say my go-tos are Seesaw, especially with primary learners. Seesaw, man, like the things you can do with that app are just amazing. Like you can... You can, what I guess the reason why I love it so much is because it's so easy to differentiate for students. So you can like have a worksheet, you take a picture of it, put it on Seesaw. First of all, that engagement right there, they're like, oh my gosh, it's technology. Well, it's the same worksheet, but that's fine. Whatever. You're going to be engaged because it's on the iPad. But the fact that you can, you can either, you know, make a worksheet, three different things for your different sets of learners. You can create an activity that's again, differentiated for all of your students to be able to do it the way that they can engage with it is also differentiated. So one reason I loved it is because if we were, let's say we read a book together and we're going to practice who the characters were in the story. Well, I can have students, they can record, they can, you know, look at a book, record the characters using their voice, which is great for those students who struggle to write, especially in those primary grades. You can have a student type in their answers. They can add images. They can draw on there, which is great too. Or, I mean, there's just like the ways that you can utilize that tool in the classroom are just mm. unlimited and they're huge. And it also works well with Google Classroom so you can embed mm. them together. And Google Classroom is another one that I really love, especially in primary grades. Because again, it's just like the ways they can engage with it and the things they can do with it are just like phenomenal. And it's such an easy differentiation tool. And when you show them how to use those things as tools, then they can access it in a way that works for them. And as long as they're showing you the learning, then who cares how they do it? You know, you can right. take pictures with it. And so like, you know, I do a lot of play-based learning. And so if they were at a center and they were playing a game, they could take a picture of it for me, show me what they were doing, and they could even record on top of it. I mean, it was just like, it's so cool. So it's like, it's holding them accountable and they get to play and I can show this to their parents too. So it's like, like, it's just huge. I love Seesaw. Like I will always use that. It's just such a cool app. No, that's incredible. I, I love hearing about all the different apps out there because every teacher has their own, but that's yeah. great because now it gives the chance for other teachers to check out Seesaw. Actually, I, have, I, I mm -hmm. don't even know what Seesaw is, but I have, right after this, I'm going to go ahead and check it out. It's so uh, cool. And talking about, just, and I, I do want to hit on one other quick topic because it's been a topic that's uh, so, it's such an important topic to talk about, which is screen time. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a yeah. lot of studies are coming out 
that mm -hmm. for the, a lot of the behaviors that we see right now, especially yeah. in our youth, I'm not even talking teen, forget about teenagers, we're talking elementary yeah. level students, the attention yeah. span, the decrease in yeah. motor growth and fine motor skills. Like mm -hmm. we've we've literally, I've, I've seen it firsthand, you know, someone was telling yeah. me this and I mean, we own a preschool in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. They're like, oh, wow, that is so true. Like a lot of students have yeah. difficulty holding up and gripping a pencil. Um, that. And that's a, a, a lot of that is associated to much more screen time. I was talking mm -hmm. with another uh, teacher. I, I, I apologize. I forget who I was speaking with, but she was saying, hey, remember when you would go to restaurants and if you brought your child along with you, they would give you a paper and crayons and pencils so your yeah. child can draw. Now, yeah. I don't know if it's in Colorado, but over here, it's just a tablet screen and you can play games on it, you know? No yeah, way. It's, I've yeah. not seen that here. We it's still like have those the kiosk and crayons. It's th those kiosk machines where you can pay yeah. with it. Like they're yeah. typically in chain restaurants, but still. Right. And I was like, wow, all of these little things are just, yeah. you don't realize it when it's a one-off, but right. when you put all these things together. So yeah. how do we, like, what do you, what do you think about screen time? Like, how do we balance that for our elementary age students because obviously mm -hmm. it's so immersed right we have ipads you know I'm, yeah. I'm sure like over here in new york city every child here has yeah. an ipad that's given yeah. to by the doe mm -hmm. how do we mm -hmm. how do we balance that well i'm gonna fall back on one of my favorite quotes like kids love ipads they love screen time they love tv they also love jumping in mud puddles. They also love playing with toys. They also love reading books. So I think the biggest thing is balance. So yes, do they want to be on the computer all day? Absolutely, they do. They will just sit on it. But then, like you said, they don't. They're not getting the gross and fine motor skills they need. They're not getting the social emotional. You know, they don't learn how to share and interact. And it's we can see it. We can see it impacting our our children and our students. And we see how much. It's harming them. And so it's just like you said, it's balance. Okay, let's do this cool activity on Seesaw. Now let's put our iPads away and let's go play a game together. Let's do different centers that you can, that are differentiated to meet needs of different students. Let's read a book together. Let's go outside and do, you know, a lesson outside. Again, it's just all about balance. It's like, yes, we can do that and use it as a tool. And we can also put it away and do something else that's not screen time at all. And I think that's the biggest piece of it is learning how to utilize it as a tool, but it's not taking up their entire day because yeah, they, they still need to learn how to use handwriting. They still need to learn how to write. Even if in 20 years, we're only using iPads and devices to type, right. like, yes, those are important skills. And so is writing and learning all of those types of things too. Right. That's, that's a good point. Actually, I, I, I do wonder if in 20 years, we are, our students are going to learn how to write. I truly hope so because, yeah. um, so you know, instead of typing, writing, you're able to memorize and take it, retain mm -hmm. the information right. uh, uh, much faster than typing on right. a keyboard. There's so many, so many, so many studies that have shown that, but yeah, yeah. it just looks like we're trending towards that, you know, writing mm -hmm. as also, I mean, listen, I, 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 I don't even, I don't write uh, ever. <laughs> I use yeah. my keyboard 24 seven. I mean, right. I don't remember the last time I picked up a pen. That sounds really bad actually, huh? Uh, <laughs> and here I am complaining. Well, you wonder why I love it so much, right? Cause we do it too. That's the thing is exactly. like, you know, and I'm not gonna lie. I still pull out a notebook and I write because that's how I learn best. And when I take notes, I can doodle and put it in different categories. That makes sense for me that I just can't do as quickly on the computer. And so yeah. I still fall back on that, you know, but I do, I mean, most of my day is on my computer. So. Yeah. Well, uh, Lindsay, I do have one last question for you and it's not a question. It's more of a, a, a short fun activity over here. I, I know you shared over here on your social media, uh, a post here recently, Actually, maybe it's not that recent, but it is a, would you rather, it's an easy, engaging, and no prep activity for the 100th day. So we're going to go ahead and play a Would You Rather teacher <laughs> edition, okay? Are you ready? Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Okay. All right. So first question. Would you rather attend a heated meeting with parents or attend a heated meeting with administration? Mm, a heated meeting with administration. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Parents are I'm allowed to do argue right? more with administration than I can with parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's. We'll we'll do a quick, easy one. Would you rather have the ability to speak to animals or speak ten different foreign languages fluently? Oh, oh, that's a hard one. Uh, I think ten different languages fluently. Okay, I love. Are you are you like? Do you have like animals or something? Do I have? I have one animal. 
Okay. Okay. I, I would pick the same exact thing. I would, I, I would put, I would pick that I would love the ability to speak, to speak 10 foreign languages. I feel like uh, you could my... communicate with a lot more people than like, not that like talking to animals wouldn't be cool, but like, I feel like you could get a lot more done <laughs> speaking 10 languages. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So would you rather discover a cockroach in the coffee machine of your school? Do you drink coffee? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay, great. I love coffee. I'm <laughs> drinking coffee right now. Okay, so that's good. So coffee in the, uh, sorry, a cockroach in the coffee machine, or would you like to, or find a rat in your school supply closet? Mm, rat in the supply closet. It's like not going to affect as many things as a cockroach in the <laughs> coffee. Would you rather have a student spill a gallon container of rainbow glitter on the floor or a, an entire bottle of glue in your hair. Oh man! But it's uh, a it's a really hard glitter to you know the rainbow glitter to pick up. It's the one that yeah you know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> yep, I think I'm gonna have to say the glue in my hair because okay. I don't want to do glitter all over the floor. It never comes out. How, how do you get glue out of your hair? I, I I don't know. I think well, if it's like Elmer's glue, you could just wash your hair and it come right out. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't I didn't know that for some the reason. Glitter I thought... on the floor would be there forever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, <laughs> and I have one more would you rather question for you. Would you rather walk barefoot in a public restroom or monitor standardized <laughs> testing for different classrooms eight hours straight? Oh, gosh. Ugh. Oh, mm, I guess I'd have to say walking barefoot in a public bathroom. Yeah, that's a, that's it's a, that's that a, that's bad a, to monitor standardized testing. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good question because I mean you have to for, when you when you do when you're a proctor for standardized testing you have to watch the students you can't just sit down and just do anything so, yeah so rough and so for eight it's, hours it's... I don't think I could do it I just don't think I could do that that's a long fair time. enough so we'll walk barefoot in a public restroom that's that's <laughs> I, I would I would easily pick that any day over uh, right. monitoring students for eight hours in a row. Well, oh, Lindsay, gosh. thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I love the insight that you've given us uh, for teachers who are interested in your um, in your uh, course. Uh, please go ahead and check it out. And I do know you have also incredible resources on TPT as well, like various instructional mm -hmm. resources. I didn't get the chance to ask you that, but do you want to like very quickly just let, let us know what resources you have on uh, TPT or your website? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, just like a lot of things we talk about, I'm all about differentiating for students, play-based learning. And so I have a lot of those different tools that I utilize um, on TPT as well as tons of social emotional, because I know how important that is. And again, like making it engaging and, you know, fun for students. That's what I'm all about. So that's what you'll see with me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much.